Reed couldn't believe Shelley and her brothers were ignoring the sounds. How could they not hear them? You never said wh where you're going, Pickle said. Another robot impact on the model house, another wimp outside. Pickle didn't mention the mimicking sound. Reed's legs gave out and he dropped to the ground. He wasn't so eager to go outside anymore, no. He now wanted more than anything to stay inside, maybe forever. He looked around. Were all the windows and doors locked? What if they weren't? No, of course they were. Mrs. Gerard wouldn't forget to lock up. She was as fanatical about safety as she was about keeping her children well fed. Reed? Reed looked at Pickle. Oh, I forgot what I was thinking of. You forgot you what you you forgot you wanted to leave a few seconds ago, Pickle asked. Reed nodded. I think I ate too much. My brain is drowning in buffalo sauce. Pickle came up with a partial smile. Mum does make great chicken wings. He leaned forward. Hey, I wonder if there are more. Or more of those popper things. He looked at his sister. Hey, Shell, do you know if Mum put away any extra chicken wings or those popper things? Shelly looked up from her book. Huh? Chicken wings? Poppers? Oh, no, they're all gone, Shelly said. And you can't be hungry already. How is it fair you get to eat so much and stay so skinny? My life would be paradisiacal <laughs> if I could eat like you with no consequences. Like paradise, Reed thought, in spite of himself. Ori had stopped ploughing the robot into the miniature house. Now he was circling the robot around the house at a dizzying speed. I can't help it if I'm hungry, Pickle told his sister. Well, you can't be hungry. Maybe you're just thirsty. I want a soda, Ori cried out. It was the first thing he'd said since he returned to playing with Pickle's robot. Hey, that sounds good, Pickle said. We don't have any, Shelley said. Why? Pickle asked. Remember? Mum read some article about the combination of carbonation and sugar. She discovered that our bodies process the mixture as if, as if it was poison in the system. Right, I do remember that, Pickle sighed. We shouldn't let her read. All she seems to read are things that make our lives suck. Read, who by now who had wound ah, read who by now had wound himself tighter than Pickle's grasp of basic math blurted, "Your lives don't suck." Pickle, with an open mouth, turned to look at Reed. Sorry, Reed said. Sorry. Pickle said nothing, but Shelley put down her book and looked at Reed with one eyebrow raised. Reed shrugged. It's just that you're so lucky to live in this nice house and have a mother who always makes good food for you and loves you, and he stopped because he felt like he was going to cry, and he did not want to do that. It was distress. He was making himself crazy with his panic. The little robot started climbing up the side of Shelley's miniature house. It looked like he it looked like it had somehow grown suction cups on its legs. It scaled the side of the toy house as if it was a spider. For a moment, Reed was mesmerized by the fun by the robot's functionality, and then he realized he was hearing something outside the Gerard's house. Something new, something majorly disturbing. Something was crawling up the outside wall of the family room. No, that couldn't be, could it? Reed tried to block out the sound of the little robot's clicks and drone. He listened hard beyond that. Wasn't that distant shuffling around something on the house? Yes, there. He could hear a sort of scrabbling, similar to what it sounded like when he once saw a raccoon climb up the side of his own house. Maybe it was a raccoon out there now. Maybe he was literally going insane and he was imagining all of this. He had to be going insane. What was he... What, uh, what he was hearing wasn't possible. But then... Why would he suddenly be going loopy? Was it guilt? Was he such an unadulterated wuss that the second he did something a little gutsy, his brain lost its grip on reality? Was he just going crazy because he locked Julius into the exoskeleton? You're right, Pickle said. Reed almost jumped out of his skin. What? Pickle cocked his head at Reed's peculiar behaviour. I said you're right. We are lucky. It was illogical of me to have allowed that to escape my awareness. Perhaps my blood sugar is low. If I have a soda, we don't have any, Shelley repeated. I want a soda, Ori said again. He must not have wanted one so badly because he was still playing with the robotic skeleton. He'd gotten it to climb up to the second floor of the small house. Reed jumped up and headed towards the stairs. Where are you going, Pickles a Pickle asked. Reed stopped. Good question. He didn't normally wander around the Gerard's house if, as if he lived there. He'd been upstairs, of course, to both of the twins' bedrooms and even in Ori's bedroom, but he'd only been in the rooms when they were in the rooms. 
What reason did he have to go upstairs now? What reason, besides his uncontrollable need to know if something was clutching onto the exterior walls of the house by the second floor windows? Uh, sorry, I just thought of a book I needed to borrow. I was going to get it. I should have asked first. Pickles studied Reed for a few seconds, and then he shrugged. Sure, go ahead. You don't need to ask your family. This, for some reason, made Reed choke and cough, as if the words created an emotional hairball in his throat. But he knew it wasn't the words that were choking him. It was his guilt. No one in the Girard family would have done what he did to Julius, even if Julius was still um, just locked into his metal skeleton in the robotics classroom. They sure wouldn't have let Julius get tortured, possibly to death, by Pickle's remote. The second they even had an inkling that it might be happening, they would have gone to check. What Reed lacked was initiative, motivation, impetus. <laughs> Aha! Nisus! And an effort to attain a goal. What? Um, Reed shook his head. His brain was weird. Yep, definitely. Uh, here he was in a total freakout because he was pretty sure he'd tortured someone who was now climbing up the outside of the Gerard's house in a giant robotic exoskeleton, and his brain was defining words of the day. Maybe if Reed had more nicest this evening, he would have saved Julius before Julius started crawling up the side of the house. Stop it, Reed screamed in his head. Julius is not on the side of the house. Oh, how Reed hoped he was out of his mind. He had a very, very, very bad feeling, though, that he was the same as anyone. For some reason, he'd just become clairvoyant. Or was it omniscient? Or maybe it was just observant and sensory aware because he could still hear something that was definitely not tree limbs crawling against the house. Reed realised that Pickle had given him permission to go upstairs and Reed was still standing here. What was wrong with him? He shook himself and strode to the stairs. Then he ran up the stairs, two at a time. On the landing, Reed stopped and looked around. Now that he was here, what was he going to do? If he looked out a window and actually saw what he was afraid he'd see, what was he going to do about it? How could he get rid of Julius and his exosuit without his friends knowing? Heck, for that matter, how could he get rid of Julius, period? Reed looked up and down the hall in complete indecision. What now? Shelley's tidy white and green room was to the right. Shelley loved white and green, the colours of purity and life, she once told Reed. Pickle's cluttered, black-walled room was to the left. Ori's race car motif bedroom was across from Pickle's room. A small pale yellow half bath was straight ahead of Reed. The light suddenly shined through a window in the bathroom from outside. Reed gulped. He remembered that the Girards had motiva uh, motivation. What? <laughs> had motion sensor lights in the backyard. One of them had just come on. Reed stared at the window intently, but he nothing happened, except for the light. He didn't see anything. Nothing appeared in the window. No shadows. No movement. He couldn't hear anything moving anymore either. He strained to listen. Nothing. Remembering he was supposed to be up here looking for a book, he figured he should head to Pickle's room and find something that he could come up with um, some plausible explanation for wanting. He ignored the prickly sensation on the back of his neck as he took a step in the dark hallway. Images of Julius's bloody, maimed body jumped into the forefront of Reed's mind, and he had to swallow down a scream. It's just my out-of-control imagination, he thought. Flipping a switch just inside the doorway of Pickle's room, Reed gratefully left the dark hall and entered his friend's domain. Stuffed with books, CDs and scientific equipment, Pickle's room more resembled a laboratory than a bedroom. Only the twin bed with its constellations bedspread suggested the room belonged to a boy just into his teens. The rest of the space screamed genius. Reed crossed to Pickle's wall of water wall bookshelf. He went to the section where he knew Pickle kept fiction. Pickle read more non-fiction than fiction, but he did have a selection of sci-fi books he claimed were educational as many of, of his science books. Reed plucked one of the books from the shelf without looking at it. After he had the book, he stepped over to the window and looked out past Pickle's grey curtains. Unfortunately, the light in the room gave him a view of little more than his own reflection. He hadn't thought that though, obviously. Uh, he hadn't thought that through, obviously. You don't try to see outside at night from a well-lit room. But even with the reflection of the room in the way, Reed could see enough to tell that nothing was outside the, the window. Clutching the book he'd taken from the shelf, he turned toward the door. He spotted bloody tissues on Pickle's nightstand. Pickle's nose. 
Reed was supposed to remind him to ice his nose. He'd do that when he went back downstairs. If he got to go back downstairs. What if Julius, in his probably ruined state, was lurking outside one of the windows up here, just waiting for Reed to appear so he could crash through the glass and get revenge? Why was Reed even up here? He should have been hiding far away from where he thought Julius and his exoskeleton was. Who went to, who went toward danger instead of away from it? Someone who wasn't 100% sure the danger was real. Reed had to know whether his thoughts were right or crazy. He made himself return to the hallway so he, conti he could continue his search for whatever was or wasn't out there. It was still dark throughout the upstairs and it was still silent. Reed crept across the hall into Ori's bedroom. At the threshold, he tripped over something and caught himself by the door jam. His heart rate sped up. He'd heard a metallic clink when his foot made contact with whatever it was. What if it was an exoskeleton? He quickly turned on the light, almost afraid to see what was on the floor. It was just a toy fire, fire truck. Reed exhaled. He looked around Ori's chaotic mess. He couldn't remember seeing so many toy cars in one place, not even in a toy store. Ori had one of those rugs with a racetrack on it. Toy cars were scattered all over the track, and beyond the racetrack rug onto the wall-to-wall -wall carpet too. Nothing unusual here. A bright red shade with a cartoon race car on it pulled over, or was pulled over Ori's single window. Reed couldn't bring himself to open that shade to look outside. As he flipped the light switch and stood once again in the hall, it occurred to Reed that turning on lights hadn't been that smart. Not only did it did the interior lights impair his night vision, but the lights telegraphed where he was. If something was outside, it could be hiding when he turned on the lights. Well, that was just dumb. Why would Julius be hiding? If it was Julius outside, if anything was outside. Reed wasn't sure at this point that either possibility would bring him relief. Either there was a broken and gory monster clinging onto the side of the house, or Reed was just having a complete mental breakdown. Either way, he couldn't just stand here forever. Reed? Shelley called from the bottom of the stairs. Reed froze as if he'd been caught reading her diary or something. Yeah? His voice broke. We're going down to the corner to get sodas. Do you want to come with? No, that's okay. You go ahead. I'll stay here if that's all right with you. Sure, just don't go in Ori's room. You'll probably break a foot on one of his cars. I'm pretty sure he has some kind of vehicle assembly line in his room. Shelley snorted when Ori protested in the background. I do not. Wait, what's an assembly line? Reed smiled. For a second, he felt almost normal as he listened to Pickle, Shelley and Ori head to the door. Oh, Reed, Pickle called again. Reed went vigid again. He cleared his throat. What? Don't tell mum where we went if she comes home early. Pickle yelled up the stairs. You're an idiot, Shelley told her brother. You think he doesn't know everything we do? She does? Ori asked in an awed tone. Everything. Everything, Shelley said empathetically as the door... Oh, sorry, emphatically. Sorry, <laughs> that's a new word. Shelley said emphatically as the front door opened. Reed listened to the stomps and shuffles of his friends leaving the house. The door slammed. He waited. He heard the lock slide into place, and he said a silent thank you for the way Shelley had adopted her mother's safety con consciousness. At the same time, he became ultra aware that he was completely 100% alone in the Gerard's house. If what he thought was outside was indeed outside, this could be bad for him. Really bad. What if Julius had been waiting for an opportunity just like this? But why? Why would Julius wait if he, ha if he was a lacerated monster? Wouldn't he just want to kill anything in sight? Wait, now Reed's brain was really getting way out there. Just because Julius might have been mangled by the exoskeleton Reed had locked him into and Ori had inadvertently made it do things that tortured Julius with mind-crumbling pain didn't mean Julius had suddenly turned into a killer. He was still just a kid, maybe a horrible kid, and maybe now even a badly injured kid, but just a kid. But was he just a kid? Not really. Julius was a really mean kid. Reed would never forget the day Julius first showed up in his school in third grade. He wouldn't forget it because that's when his own torture started. Julius had been tormenting Reed for six years. Julius seemed to thrive on humiliating other kids and he seemed to get downright euphoric when he hurt them. For all Reed knew, Julius had, uh, was already a killer. At the very least, he'd probably been murdering and dissecting squirrels for years. 
So if Julius was now in unspeakable pain because of what Reed did, it made sense that he'd been even more homicidal now. Reed didn't know for sure, but he figured agony brought out the worst in a person. The house creaked, and Reed leaped out of his pointless thoughts, uh, thoughts, <laughs> thoughts and back into the dark hall. That sound was just the house creaking, wasn't it? He listened for several minutes. When he didn't hear anything else, he crept down the hall to Shelley's room. He knew he wouldn't step on anything in here. She was obsessed with order. Going slowly, he felt his way through her room until he reached her, her window, which he knew overlooked the front of the house. Standing back from the edge of the window, he lifted the edge of her heavy green curtains and peeked outside. Nothing was out there that shouldn't have been. Below the window, the porch roof stretched along the, the front of the house. By the street, the mailbox leaned a little to the left. Two large... Two large trees... <laughs> Stre I, I, sorry, I, I don't know how to say that either. I should probably look that up someday. I'm probably being really dumb. Two large trees. I don't want, because I don't want to say cheddar. <laughs> like, and cedar? Ch cedar? I don't know. You guys are going to have to tell me. <laughs> I'm very dumb. Two large trees stretched their branches towards Shelley's window. One of the branches brushed against the side of the house. Although, as Reed had thought, it wasn't windy. There was a slight breeze and the branch moved against the siding. Was this the sound Reed had heard earlier? Had he gotten himself all worked up for nothing? He hoped so, but he didn't think he was worried about nothing. Scanning the night, he searched for any sign of movement. He saw none. Stepping away from the window, Reed picked his way out of Shelley's room. In the hallway, he hesitated. Should he go into Mr. and Mrs. Gerard's room? He looked around. As long as he didn't touch anything, why not? It wasn't like he was going to turn on the light and snoop around. He just wanted to look out their big window, which overlooked the backyard. Reed crossed the hall and stepped into the master bedroom. A nightlight near the master bath cast a dim glow throughout the room. It created creepy shadows, but at least it made manoeuvring to the window easy. All he had to do was swivel a rocking chair away from the window and nudge aside the curtain. Then he was able to see nothing unusual. Again, the yard looked like it the way it should. All was quiet. Enough of this! Reed dropped the curtain and strode from the room. He looked over the hall, then ran down the steps and returned to the family home. Uh, room, sorry. The family room looked the way it had when he'd left it, minus the Gerard siblings. Apparently Pickle had put a small log on the fire after Reed went upstairs because the fire was flaring up behind the metal screen that protected the room from stray sparks. Pickle's book was on the end of the table next to his dad's easy chair. Shelley's book was lying on the sofa. Reed sank into the uh, cushy, yeah, cushy carpet. He looked around. Where was the little robot? He didn't see it. Did Ori take it with him? Reed spotted the remote on the floor next to the sofa, but the robot wasn't in sight. Maybe Ori got it stuck under a piece of furniture. Reed turned and looked at Shelley's miniature house. It really was an amazing thing. It seemed to be accurate in every little detail. All the furniture he could see on the front porch and inside of the house through the open doors was exactly like the real furniture in the normal sized house. What about the art and stuff? He wondered. He scooted over to examine the house more closely. As, as he figured she would have, Shelley had re recreated all the art and knickknacks inside the house. Anything in this real house was in the toy house. She'd even put pencil marks with dates on the wall just inside the kitchen doorway, the marks and dates that chronicled the Girard kids' growth over the years, and outside one of the downsp uh, downspouts was bent just like the real one out of the front was. It got bent when Reed and Pickle were trying to learn how to throw a football. One of their errant tosses, though forceful, went badly askew and left a permanent indentation in the metal. Reed shifted again so he could look at the, the miniature version of the room he sat in. Wow, he breathed. There was a super miniature house inside the super miniature house. Talk about realism. It shouldn't have surprised him that Shelley was that thorough with her model house. Shelley never did anything halfway, and if she couldn't do it well, she stopped doing it. Reed remembered finger painting was pickle in Shelley in kindergarten. The, che the teacher had been wandering around telling everyone they were doing great, but when she got to Shelley, she didn't say anything. Aren't I doing great too? Shelley asked. Of course, kiddo, the teacher said. You're lying, Shelley accused. I can tell by the tone of your voice. She stood up 
and put her hands on her hips, careful to avoid getting paint on her red pants. Reed remembered watching the teacher think it over. She finally decided on the truth. Well, you aren't really getting to the point of finger you aren't really getting the point of finger painting. It's to be free with the colour and have fun. You're trying too hard, making everything too perfect. Fine, Shelley said. She reached up, grabbed her paper and marched over to put her finger painting in the trash. Reed grinned at the memory. Then he saw something silver and shiny glinting through the window at the back of the mini model house's room. He leaned forward and canted his head so he could see behind the mini model house. <laughs> That's where the little robot went. It was inside the miniature house, behind the mini miniature house. Reed started to reach into the miniature house to rescue the robot. Before he could get a hand in through the front door though, the little robotic skeleton raised up off the floor of the house. Reed jumped, then started to shake his head at his edginess. <laughs> and that's when Julia sprang up from behind the model house. Reed scrambled backward, screaming. In his mind, he called what he was seeing Julius because his vivid imagination had prepared him to see the boy he, the way he looked now. But Julius didn't look a thing like Julius. He was, in fact, exactly what Reed's mind had known Julius would be. Now nothing more than a fleshy octopus-like mass of pulpy limbs attached to a metal frame. Julius can no longer be called a boy. He wasn't, he couldn't be called human. Reed wasn't even sure Julius was alive. Yes, Julius moved, but Reed didn't know if that was Julius initiating the movement or if his corpse was being controlled by the metal framework latched onto Julius like a loathsome external parasite. Julius's face was slack, so there was no life there. It was slack because it looked like the bone structure of his forehead, cheeks and jaw had been pulverised. His features were so distorted, he resembled some kind of crudely sewn cloth version of himself. No longer framed by wavy blonde hair because that hair was now sticky and stringy with congealed blood, Julius's face was like a repulsive doll's face, a doll much worse than Alexa's baby doll with the staring black eyes. Julius's eyes were a thousand times more disconcerting than empty black ones. His eyes had rolled back in his head, so all that he was showing was the whites, the murky cloudy whites. Those ghosty, ghostly whites made him look like a sightless zombie. But like a zombie, Julius, alive or not, was moving. He was moving determinately, um, determinedly, sorry, toward Reed. Reed willed his legs to work, and he struggled to find his feet. Looking wildly around the room, he decided to decide, he tried to decide on the best escape route. The windows? They had a complicated latching system. He wouldn't be able to get them open in time. The doors? Duh. Reed ran toward the French doors. He knew they had a special lock, the kind that required keys on the outside or the inside, but the key was kept near the door, wasn't it? He scanned the area near the door. No key. He realised he had no idea whether Gerard's kept the key and he had no time to look for it. Turning, Reed ran toward the entryway. The Julius thing scuttled out from behind the miniature house and tumbled across the floor after him. Reed tore through the archway, rounding the corner and heading to the front door. Before he could get there, though, Julius sprang to the ceiling and skittered past Reed to block his way to the front door. Reed didn't pause to consider his options, he just raced up the stairs. Glancing over his shoulder, Reed watched in horror as Julius and his metal frame flailed, crushed limbs grotesquely to catapult from the entry ceiling to the stairway wall. The Julius thing scaled the stairway wall as Reed ran. Reed was barely able to stay ahead of his persper. Well, persper? Pursuer. <laughs> Oh, I keep messing up, and it's annoying me. I'm sure it's annoying you too, I'm very sorry. At the landing, Reed got a glimpse of Julius leaping to the ceiling again. Reed turned, aiming for Pickle's room. His plan, if he could call it that, was to use Pickle's scientific equipment as weapons to keep Julius at bay while Reed escaped out of Pickle's front-facing window. Like Shelley's, it was all over the front porch roof, so Reed wouldn't have to drop two stories to the ground. Although at this point, he'd have dropped multiple stories if... It meant getting away from Julius, or whatever, or what was left of him. Feeling something at the same time rubbery and sharp nick his shoulder as he tore into Pickle's room. Reed managed to get the light on as he entered. He grabbed the first piece of equipment he saw, a big and heavy microscope, almost too big and heavy for him to lift, but he managed. Once he had the microscope in his firm grip, Reed turned and swung blindly out in front of him. He was sure he'd connect with Julius because Julius was right on his heels, but Julius wasn't there. Reed looked around desperately. Where did Julius go? Reed looked up. 
The Julius abomination dropped off the ceiling and landed on Reed before Reed could swing the microscope again. The impact knocked the microscope from Reed's hand. It tumbled across the room as Reed screamed and tried to squirm out from under the horrendous combination of hard and sharp metal and squishy, clammy, destroyed body parts. At the same time, he tried to hold his breath because the, the Julius thing smelled dreadful. It smelled like blood, putrid flesh and stale sweat. It was dripping on Reed, too. Julius's flesh and his no longer stylish clothing, perforated by puncture wounds caused by jutting cracked bones, was smeared with dried blood, uh, and his body was seeped flesh blood too. Galvanised by his revulsion, Reed struck out at, at the metal and flesh that attempted to engulf him. He fought with all the strength he had and some he'd obviously gotten from someplace else. At first, Reed thought he was going to be able to get away. Julius's hands didn't work right and they couldn't grip Reed firmly. Reed managed to slither out from under Julius and he stood, preparing to race around the bed to escape out the window. But what Julius lacked in coordination and grip, he made up for in speed. Reed made it halfway to the window, but then caught something caught his foot. No, not something. Julius saw his frame or both. Reed looked back at the combination of metal and tissue that coiled around his ankle. Let me go, Reed yelled. Why did he waste his breath? Did he really think a shouted command would stop whatever Julius had become? It wouldn't have stopped human Julius. It sure wasn't going to stop his this version of Julius. Reed kicked out and his foot slipped away just a little. But then Julius clamped down harder. How? How is Julius going to uh, how is Julius able to grip anything without working bones? It didn't matter. Reed was just distracting himself with all these irrelevant thoughts. He was trying to put off the inevitable. Reed wasn't going to get away from Julius, not even if he made it to the window. Julius was now powered by a robotic framework a mere human couldn't defeat, especially if that mere human was Reed. Plus, Julius now seemed to be supercharged by the monstrosity that he'd become, and that monstrosity had been born of the kind of emotions that propelled humans past their usual limitations. Emotions like pain and fear. Emotions like rage. Julius's rage was more powerful than Reed's guilt. Reed didn't stand a chance, but still he tried, kicking his feet as if power swimming against the tide. Reed army crawled across the rug. He willed himself away from what held on to him. He imagined himself going through Pickle's window and jumping to freedom. Reed let out a banshee-like cry and yanked his foot from Julius's grasp. He staggered to his feet and turned toward the window. Before Reed could take a step, though, Julius was on him again. This time, Julius fell fully onto Reed, and they both went down on Pickle's bed. Oi, oi. <laughs> Reed was pinned under Julius's hideous remains and the metal frame strapped to them. Reed inhaled Julius's stench and gagged. Even as he gagged, he cried out, Help! Whose help was he calling for? No one else was in the house. Would the neighbours hear? Reed's face was just inches from Julius's lifeless eyes and sagging mouth. Gagging again and whimpering, Reed turned his face away from the horror above him. He shut his eyes as if he could make his macabre or... I can never say that word. Macabre. No, it is macabre, right? His macabre attacker disappeared by pretending it wasn't there. His heart pounding so loud he could hear little else. Reed bucked and lurched, trying to free himself from the thing. But he wasn't strong enough, even though Julius didn't seem to be gripping Reed in any way. His weight alone, along with the, all that of all the metal framework, was enough to pin Reed in place. Reed was trapped. Practically hyperventilating in shock and fright, Reed forced himself to open his eyes and look at Julius. When he did, he was sorry. He immediately closed his eyes again. He couldn't stand looking at the milky white, irisless eyes staring down at him. Or were they staring? Or, uh, yeah. <laughs> Reed didn't know if Julius was conscious. How could he be with his bones crushed into smithereens? It was more likely Julius was dead and the movement of the thing was he was strapped into was caused by some kind of short in the system. Maybe the interference of Pickle's remote had so badly fried the exoskeleton systems that it was widely fun functioning on its own now. Something dripped into Reed's face. He had to open his eyes. It was worse not knowing what was happening above him. Reed opened his eyes. Okay, maybe not knowing wasn't worse. 
blood was pooling in the spongy mass of what used to be Julius's face. It looked like a misshapen sponge that had been used to clean up a massacre. And now it was dripping its warm, wet contents, or contents uh, onto Reed's cheeks. The previously cream-coloured scarf looped around Julius's neck was saturated, too. It, hung, it hung down toward Reed like a dead animal in a slaughterhouse, mesmerised by now how of the whites... Sorry. <laughs> Mesmerised now by the whites of Julius's eyes bulging out from between long blonde lashes, Reed couldn't turn away from the malformed thing above him, but he, was st but he still struggled. Grunting, he shoved upward with all his might. It did no good. It was like the weight of a hundred cars pinned him down. Please, please, Reed whispered. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. I didn't know this was going to happen to you. I just wanted you to be locked in overnight. I didn't want this to happen. He knew there was no use in begging, but he couldn't help himself. He opened his mouth to say something else, but that's when the question of whether Julius had consciousness was answered. Julius shifted downward to press his heavy, seeping mass against Reed's mouth. Reed could no longer speak, but he could hear. In the distance, downstairs, the other kids were returning from their soda run. Reed could hear Pickle suggesting to Shelley that he could construct a better torture device than anything medieval people had come up with. I'm not sure that would be an accomplishment, Pickle, Shelley said. Reed strained, grunting, desperate to get their attention. Trying to yell, Reed could only make out unintelligible groans. Downstairs, Ori piped up. Can I play with the remote again, Pickle? Julius shifted, and Reed allowed himself a moment of hope. Maybe he could get away. Pouring every bit of life force he had into his muscles, he surged upwards. He hoped to erupt like a volcano and get ejected away from Julius toward freedom. But he didn't erupt. Or rather, he did. But before he could get ejected away from the Julius cage that imprisoned him, Julius's mashes, ma uh, mashed hands somehow grabbed hold of Reed's outstretched hands. Julius's formless legs somehow managed to wrap tightly around Reed's ankles. Reed was now as linked to Julius as Julius was to his exoskeleton, and Reed knew what, he, uh, what was going to happen next. With the pressure of Julius's face wedged against Reed's throat, Reed couldn't make a sound that could be heard downstairs. He was facing his worst nightmare, and he couldn't scream. Downstairs, Pickle responded to his brother's question. Sure, Ori. Go nuts. We have all night. Ori grinned and knelt on the floor next to the miniature house. Usually interested only in cars and racing, Ori was surprised by how much fun this robot was. Maybe he could get his brother to build him other things. He'd never been able to get a robot to move this way before. It was super cool. Pressing a button, Ori got the, the little robot to crawl out from behind the miniature house, or the mini miniature house. He carefully manoeuvred the robot out of the miniature house, not wanting to get on his sister's bad side. One time, he ran the little skeleton into a wall. When he did, he heard something bump on the floor above his head. He looked up, but he didn't hear anything else, so he continued carefully guiding the robot out of the house and onto the miniature porch. When he got out, when he got it out, he did a little fist bump. Happy with himself, Ori grinned wider and decided to see if he could get the robot to do even weirder things than it was doing before he got his soda. He began manipulating the remote so fast his fingers were just a big blur. In response, the little robot shot off the toy ha ha house's porch and began spinning and thrashing. While Ori shouted in triumph, the little robotic skeleton began popping and snapping its metal limbs in all kinds of unnaturally delightful ways. Huh. That's, that's the end. That is the end of the breaking room. <laughs> uh, I didn't enjoy that. Genuinely. I don't know. I don't know why I didn't enjoy it. I just didn't really enjoy it. I think I was. I, I think. Hmm. I have a. I have quite a few criticisms about that. First of all, all of the characters were introduced at once at the beginning, so it took me a good, like it took me like literally half the book to understand who is who, and how they're all related and stuff. Um. So that that is that is one thing. Um. Another thing is. This literally had nothing to do with the breaking wheel. It was literally just mentioned once, and then, like, and uh, it was a completely different story. Also, I don't really understand it. Um, I think, I mean, again, I'm very dumb, and I'll have to read through this all again one time. But um, I believe the small house. I don't want to say too. I don't want to say 
all of that because it might be completely wrong and then I'm just going to look like a, a flipping idiot. Um, I, I tell you, while I read these, like sometimes I zone out, so I, I miss a few bits of information, but that's just, that's just me, so please forgive me. But the, the house obviously has something to do with it, right? Like the miniature house is like, I don't know, like, all of it is controlled by the miniature, I don't know, I don't know. What I do know, though, is that the next story is He Told Me Everything, uh, and apparently, apparently, it's a good one. So, um, I, I, I had high hopes for this one, and unfortunately, I didn't enjoy the story as much as I feel like I could have, um, but I feel like He Told Me Everything is going to be a really good one again. <laughs> so let's hope for that. Um, that will be coming out very soon. And yeah, I will see you then. So goodbye.